What's going on, everybody? Andrew Thompson here of the Andrew Thompson Interviews YouTube channel. My guest today is a former Ring of Honor world champion, former television champion, tag team champion, six-man tag team champion, a decade plus in the professional wrestling business, and some change, a decade plus in the business. This is Matt Taven. Matt, how you doing today, man? What an intro. Thank <laughs> I that, you know what? I'm better now after that intro. I mean... Usually I get nothing but like Matt Taven sucks, <laughs> but if you go online, but to have that many accomplishments right off before your introduction, I mean, that makes anyone feel good. Right, right, right. Now I, I did want to like I mentioned at the time that you've been in the business for a decade plus. Does it does it ever like dawn on you like how long you've been in wrestling and how how much time has just flown by so quick? It's terrifying. It's uh, <laughs> you know I, I've been I've been doing it over twelve years now and. To think that 12 years have gone by that quickly uh, makes you makes you scared because you're like, oh, this is all going by way too quick. I don't want this to, to be how it always is. But um, at the same time, man, and like I've been posting like throwback stuff on my Instagram stories. Like this happened 10 years ago. I'm like, oh, 10 years ago. <laughs> my God. But um, it's definitely weird. Uh, it's definitely one of the weirdest things is seeing a fan that you saw like as a child and now they're like a teenager or a growing <laughs> up and you know they show you a picture of like oh this was us when i was you know a, a eight-year-old kid i was like oh my god how long have i been doing this but um to be honest with you it's all i've ever wanted to do since i was six years old so having 12 years in the business so far is uh, is a blessing to say the least yeah, and, and I know you, uh, you, you you openly said that you had successful surgery during the pandemic. Like, like, and, and we talked about it a little bit before we started recording. What has it been like competing in front of no fans, only people that's in the, 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 the building while you're wrestling, only people that's out in the, uh, in the area while you're wrestling, is the production staff and Caprice uh, and, and, and Ian calling the action. Is, is it weird, you know, being able to be out there and, like, actually hear them talk and stuff like that? It is, it is so strange. It's so, it, it feels like how you wrestled when you're training and mm -hmm. like when you're, you know, you're first starting out at a school. Yeah. I have a wrestling school in Rhode Island and it's funny because I try to tell them, or at least we used to talk about like, this feels different because there's no crowd. You'd want to take your time here because of the crowd and, and do this because of the crowd. And now it's like, well, that's out the window. So it's more back to like a, a training style match um where it's just the two of you and it's funny you bring up you know ian and and uh, caprice because that throws you off like you know <laughs> caprice and ian have such distinct voices and they right. have like, <laughs> animation in their voices that you're in the ring and you hear like oh it's matt taven and it makes you want to like look sideways like who is screaming at me right now and uh it's it's so it, it's it's so strange not just because of um the you know lack of sound in there and hearing the voices but the, i can't i can't even explain to to people that i really haven't been in that situation how much adrenaline really comes from a crowd um, i always used to say i would love to go to mexico as probably my favorite place to wrestle because that crowd can pump anyone like that you could run through a wall in front of that crowd because they get you so hyped up uh, so it's a lot of like natural adrenaline that you really have to find in yourself when you're wrestling uh, for nothing but the screens during the pandemic. <laughs> you, you, you mentioned that you, uh, you have a wrestling school in Rhode Island. You run that with uh, Mike Bennett, right? Yeah, yeah. We started it uh, a while ago uh, called the XWA Wrestling Kingdom. And it's, it's in, in uh, West Warwick, Rhode Island, Three Bridal Lab. Um, it, which has also been very strange to do during a pandemic. You know, a, a, our classes never really stopped because during the pandemic, when everything was going crazy, we just did Zoom classes. So uh, we would watch film, we would do everything kind of over Zoom. And slowly but surely, you know, we, we, we have finally kind of been getting back in the ring and doing limited sessions. Um, but Again, it's it's such a different time right now, and we're just thankful that a we have the school still running and going, and and b for me personally that that the wrestling world in general is is still finding a way to continue on. And, and you know, at the top, we we you know I listed off uh, your accolades that you've done in ROH over the years. It's it's kind of crazy, man, because you've been with Ring of Honor through it all for for, for what it seems like you've been there since what like two thousand nine. Like yeah, my, my first dark match was in 2000, May of 2009. 
Right. That, 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 that's crazy because you've literally seen like many transformations in ROH from, from like from, from behind the scenes to, you know, the talent you've literally seen it all. Like, and I know you told the story in the past about, you know, the, like, like one, one specific reason as to why they kept you. Cause I think they, you know, they held you down in a good way, held you down in a good way. Um, you know, when, when you got injured, like, is, is that like one of the reasons why you feel that strong loyalty towards ROH is because they took care of you in that, like during that period of time of your career? I mean, there's there's absolutely no doubt. You know, five years ago, wow, that, that's it's just time is flying by. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so it'd be Final Battle 2015, which was actually the uh, me and Mike Bennett's last match as a team together. Mm-hmm. I blow out my ACL, rupture a meniscus, tear the other meniscus. And, you know, Mike ends up leaving to TNA during that time because our contracts are both up. And um, for me, it was terrifying. I didn't know what was going to happen. I was under, I, I was about to be a free agent, but not have, have no way to, to wrestle. You know, I still had, my, my first doctor told me it'd be two years before I'd be in the ring again. I was like, okay. Mm. But, uh, you know, I, I knew I would have a probably about nine months before I'd be back in the ring. And my contract expired a month or two after the initial injury. So, it was an extremely scary time and for ring of honor to show that much faith in me, you know, offer me something and not just offer me something, but say, we, we know you're going to come back better than ever. And we want you to be a part of this company really kind of five years later, it's still in the front of my mind when it, when it, when I think about my loyalty to ring of honor. Um, But man, I've seen, (laughs) I was just telling someone the other day, like my first match in ring of honor, you know, it was, it, it was um, at a gymnasium and I probably was sleeping on like a hotel floor afterwards. And I've seen us go through everything from the, you know, being on HD net and finally on TV to, to the Sinclair thing to mm-hmm. finally having pay-per-view all the way to Madison square garden. So like, there's another, not just how they've treated me makes me loyal, but there's a sense of pride to think like, I've been here for, for that long that this is almost kind of becoming my baby. And I have like a, a sense of like, there's such a huge part of me. Like I, I, I kind of am synonymous with ring of honor at this point. Yeah. And that's another just crazy thing when you think about, and we talk about time because when I first got in, you know, there were so many guys that had been there for so much longer, even when I was kind of making my way after, you know, winning titles and stuff, there was still, you know, the Roddy Strongs that had been there forever and the Kevin Steens and, I always would look at the, these guys as kind of like the torchbearers for Ring of Honor, and now to to find myself in that in that spot is uh, makes you feel a little bit older. Uh, <laughs> at the same time, it's it's something that I always wanted. You know, I always looked up to those guys and wanted those spots, and and uh, I'm I'm proud to still be here today. I, I really feel like Ring of Honor has built like a lot of goodwill up, especially like over the past year. I would say late. To late late 2019 to, to this year specifically because you know the start of stories came out about them pan, keeping talents paid during the pandemic and you know you hear about the the, the talent meetings in, in Baltimore like when they had invited you guys like the you know openly voice your opinions on what's going on and how you think the company is being ran like I think they have really built up like a lot of like decent goodwill amongst the fans I was just curious as to what you thought about that there there is no doubt about it and you know there's there's only so much that that from our side that we let out you know and there's so much that has gone on behind the scenes you know the the last in 2019 you start the year by losing basically half the roster that goes to AEW that's a huge thing and 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 I you know feel a personal sense of like yeah I I took the I became champion at that time and I felt like, yes, we can move forward. I, I, we all knew that there was going to be this, you know, kind of murky exodus. time, you know, yeah. during the exodus and, and um, kind of a, a, a branding for them and almost a re- rejuvenation for us. Um, so we all knew that there was going to be this kind of in between time. And I took a big sense of pride of saying like, I have no problem. Like I will guide us through these murky waters and you can put it on my back. But along with, you know, guys like lethal and the Briscoes, we all took this as like a sense of duty and we still take it because, you know, we're, we're constantly trying to bring ring of honor to as many people as possible because of how 
the office has always treated us behind the scenes, especially, um, you know, there, there's gets so many things that are said out in public that really don't translate to kind of how things are in reality that um, it, it kind of can get confused sometimes. And even things like those open meetings where they would say, hey, tell us what's up, more came from, from maybe the outside because on the inside, we, we always had this real like rah, rah, like put it on our chest, we're ROH and we'll get through this. And then once the pandemic hit, it's, it's not said enough how well the Ring of Honor office has treated the talent even talent that's not under, you know, contract, there were certain um, shows that were booked for April and, and uh, obviously the end mm -hmm. of March, but April as well and into May, that talent that not necessarily were under a full Ring of Honor deal uh, were booked for and they still got paid for yeah. it, paid for those dates. Ring of Honor has paid us this entire time, uh, even when we're just kind of putting out contact, uh, con uh, content like this via Zoom. Uh, they've they've honored their contracts to us and then when it came back time to finally start taping again the amount of, of procedures that that ring of honor has us go to the protocols that ring of honor has put in place to make sure we are all safe i i really haven't heard of any wrestling company going above and beyond like that to uh to make sure that their talent is taken care of during a pandemic you know we i, I Literally, before we're even allowed to show up, I have to do via Zoom, turn sideways, and <laughs> shove a stick into the back of my brain in front of a nurse. Oh, my just goodness, so, man. Just so they can say, like, okay, we can bring him to Baltimore. And then during Baltimore, we get tested Says four Says it again, more. right? <laughs> yeah, we get tested four more times. <laughs> And like they're taking the, the canvas off between every match, the, the scheduling that they have to go do to make sure because – we, we really don't even see each other that much. As much yeah. as we see each other, we're kind of still doing Zooms while we're in the bubble because they have us on a schedule where the locker room's only a certain amount of people and then in the arena's only a certain amount of people and you move all these people around in order. So, you know, there's never kind of a condensed um, big group that infection could spread. And even the, the last time, you know, unfortunately those guys, whatever happened at the collective happened and mm -hmm. the guys that were there I'm, I don't even think they tested positive any of them but just to make sure Ring of Honor went above and beyond they took care of those guys and they sent them home and um, it's it's not said enough what Sinclair Broadcasting and Ring of Honor has done not just during the pandemic but for for the whole time I've been here uh, but for for the last year or two this this office has definitely gone above and beyond for the talent. And, and, you know, kind of switching topics just for a little bit. I know we, uh, we previously talked about uh, one, one Mike Bennett. Uh, I know he's doing some work for the United Wrestling Network right now. Like, well, would you ever be interested in possibly reuniting uh, with, with Mike Bennett and possibly doing something in the, in the tag team division? I mean, it's it's one of those things that I feel like has been talked about every month since yeah. five years. <laughs> And, and, and mostly talked about via text between me and Mike. Like, you know, mm. it, it, the contracts come up and things get talked about and you're like, oh, what if we could do this, we could do that. And it's always in the back of our minds of getting the band back together. And I think there's so much more that goes into it, not just as a team, but Mike was one of the first guys in wrestling in general in my my wrestling life that I kind of really latched on to and became friends with me and Mike are the same age but I started wrestling when I was 23 and Mike started wrestling when he was 15 mm. so he had an eight-year advantage on me and so I kind of always like looked up to him and, and needed him for advice and, and to show me the way at the same time we're peas in a pod because we're the same age so I have this this weird you know friendship but to another level because he was definitely my big brother growing in the the wrestling world for the first couple of years so whenever anyone says would you want to get back together with Mike Bennett it's like of course I'd want to hang out <laughs> with my best friend all the time and tour and, and go around the world so it's one of those things where the, the the stars need to align obviously but we we are hoping that one day they do uh, unfortunately, the, the pandemic has not helped any of these things because yeah. with the amount of protocols that, you know, you have to go through a ring of honor, it's kind of a tough time to be bringing talent back in and, and just, it is so many 
and that, 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 that stuff like conflicts with their other dates as well that they have yeah, lined up. Uh, of, of course. And, you know, obviously me and Bennett could do something internationally because I'm under an exclusive contract here in the States, but mm. you can't go anywhere internationally right now in the middle <laughs> of a pandemic. Right. So, yeah. So it's like, it's to me, um, it will always be something that I think that I think both of us think about. And I think we're always just kind of waiting for the time to be right. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't seem like it's going to happen immediately like I would like it to but uh, you know hopefully one day uh, we can make sure that our last match together isn't the one where I, I blow up my ACL mm. and, and, and I think I think that would be like some real cool that you and Mike could do because like you see I mean you, you often hear it from wrestlers all the time like when they they team with somebody either it's like somebody that they're really cool with or somebody that they really that they're really not that tight with not necessarily have an issue with them but you know they just not that that tight off camera, but I think it, it works well because you and Mike are actually genuinely friends off screen. I mean, yeah, off screen, so it'll translate well to that on screen product. Yeah, and, and then that's you know, that's what made it work is that it was so genuine, it was so real, and um, you know, even with the the kingdom that came afterwards, I don't think it ever got to the point of of where me and Mike were because that was a, a, a friendship that like it came across the camera like right into your living room you could tell that these <laughs> guys wanted nothing more than to just be around each other and wrestle and just enjoy things so um it, it without a doubt is one of my fondest memories or, or fondest times in my wrestling career and uh, you know it's just you hope that uh one day you, you can live them all again so I'm I'm curious to hear about your time in, uh, in Mexico, man. I know you're a former uh, world historic middleweight champion. I hope I got that right. That's right. Yeah, yeah, you got yeah, it. There, there we go. There we go. But I'm, like, I'm, it's like a you know the NWA historic world <laughs> belt on a Wednesday. It's like the longest <laughs> title of all time. I do love the belt. <laughs> Yeah, but I, I'm curious to hear about your time in Mexico, man. But specifically, like before that, like I know you did a lot of work with Walter Lord Jr. Like I've seen some, some plenty of well, plenty of matches of his, specifically like in, in New Japan when they do the crossover tour with CML. Like I'm just curious, man. Like what, what is it like working with him? Because he seems like genuinely like one of the more underrated wrestlers out there. Like I feel like people do appreciate him, but like I'm talking about just as far as like the way he moves around the ring, I feel like it's really not praised enough. Uh, I completely agree with you. There's so many guys down at CMLL that are just not appreciated enough because, uh, you know, they get a chance to kind of bust out, whether it's the, the War of the Worlds tour yeah. with Honor mm -hmm. or uh, the Fantastic uh, Phantasm Mania or whatever at, at New Japan. And, like, at the same time, I wish that – the arena Mexico shows could break into the U S a little bit more because there's so unbelievable talent. Volador jr. He kills it every night down there. Ultimo Guerrero, um, Titan is unbelievable down yeah, there. Uh -huh. uh, you know what I mean? There's, there's just so like Saburo jr. Down there is, is great. Like there's so many guys, Cabanario. I mean, <laughs> I, I learned so much about myself down there. Um, and I, I always thought to myself, like, man, these guys, if, if, for, if people were able to, or if, if people started tuning in to Friday nights in Mexico City, these guys would be huge stars in the States because the style of wrestling down there is a little bit different, but there is no doubt that the entertainment, the athleticism, the just overall per, uh, performance and production that, that CMLL brings would translate unbelievably in in the states and it's why one of those reasons why i'm so happy that ring of honor has a relationship with them and we're able to do stuff like put the anniversary show and the grand prix on the honor club because like you said that volador jr is underrated and i've had some matches with him in arena mexico that are some of my favorites of all time you know i was never uh they don't throw money into the ring in the states and i was not <laughs> ready for when the first time that happened and uh you know it's it's one of those crazy feelings you're lying in the ring after a match and all of a sudden it usually hurts at first because you'll get pegged I, that's i bet <laughs> the first time uh, the first time it happened i actually lost the match against ultimo guerrero and i was on the ground and all of a sudden ding i started getting whacked in the head with coins and i thought people were throwing trash at me mm -hmm. uh and i was like oh no what's going on and someone was like oh everyone loves the match everyone loves the match and i was like this is kind of a weird way. No, to I'm about to say, what, 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 a, what a way to show me that you yeah, yeah. <laughs> throw the dollars, throw the dollars. Um, but it's it's 
there's nothing like a Friday night in Arena Mexico. And if you're one of those crazy wrestling fans that has to be like, oh, I have to see a show at the Tokyo Dome. I have to see a show at Madison Square. Mexico City, it, Arena Mexico should be at the top of that list because there is zero that, that will ever uh, compare to the atmosphere of Arena Mexico. And, and, and I'm curious, it's like something you just said, you talk about like the style of wrestling and the difference between here, like, like what it is like in Mexico and like what you normally see you know, in, in, in most of the popular wrestling regions in, in the U.S. Like, I'm, I'm just curious, like, what, like, so, like, just from what I've seen from, from you know, like, when I see these Fantastic Mania tours and stuff like that, like, I always see, like, a, a, a common type thing. Like, I always see, like, the, 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 the dragon screw to the outside, and then they, like, swiftly slide out the ring, and then they wait for the tope to come. And, like, I always think, I guess, you know, stuff you notice like that, you just yeah. have a habit of seeing it, and I always think, like, so, like, what, when you when you go over there and, like, you try to, adjust or you know they try to adapt to your style like what's the what, what's the middle ground right there well you know you, you definitely kind of hit the nail on the head when i'm down there especially in a bigger match they'll try to adapt the styles a little bit more but the first time you're down there and the first time you, and when you're on the undercard you gotta learn <laughs> you gotta learn quick and it took me a second or two because there's so many different things like you were just saying you know the 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 um the spots that lead into dives and just like the no tags alone. The first time I was down there, I remember giving someone an arm ringer and reaching out to tag my partner. And they looked at me like I was an alien who never had wrestled in his life. They were like, what is this guy doing? Um, and just like the three falls, it's just so many different things that you have to prepare for the first time you're down there. But it was one of those things that I uh, wanted to learn you know what i mean i i went down there with that goal of like you've been to japan you've wrestled in the uk you wrestled in the states you know what i mean you wrestled in canada all these other places but like mexico has a such a unique style that it will be a noticeable difference if you take this lucha libre style and add it to whatever matt taven right. is at this moment and it definitely took a bit uh to kind of figure it out but um I put it as like a notch on the belt because I looked up to guys forever. I've, I've been a wrestling fan since I was six. And I looked up to guys that had, had told these stories about going down to Mexico and learning that style, going to, to uh, Japan and learning that style. And, and as a fan, as a kid, I was like, these are the things I'm going to do. I'm going to have to go to Mexico. I'm going to have to go here. I'm going to have to go there. So I definitely jumped on the opportunity uh, to do that and to add that kind of, versatility to uh matt taven's repertoire and, and uh, like now i go down there and i almost feel like i have to if another you know ring of honor guys with me i have to like prepare them <laughs> and there are so many things like i i'm glad that there are you know there's only a couple of shows a week that make it to television because some of those in between shows i was an absolute embarrassment like just lost in the ring like looking around like i don't know what's about to happen uh so it definitely takes a while, but um, once you get the hang of it, it's it's an art form that you learn to love. So, and another thing uh, about your time in Mexico, can can we please talk about getting your head shaved in the ring? Because I, I I know that's something that's like really there. So like, when, when when you approach with something like that, is it more so of a thing where you're like, okay, you know, I'll do this, or is it is is it a more of a thing of whoever's in this spot? somebody's getting their head shaved like I, like how does that like or, or was that a decision that you made you like may, maybe I want to cut the hair so let's you know let's so, go ahead and do it there's it's a little bit of both and like here's the thing was that there was four guys in my match mm -hmm. so there was definitely a couple of guys that weren't that weren't down with you know getting their head shaved so right um, yeah. <laughs> you know the the thought had had crossed my mind before and it's such a tradition down there and it's such like a huge spectacle um and it was kind of proposed to me uh in a way that was like i had gone down there and done well i won the title and they they wanted to to do like a mask or hair match and you know the ideas started floating around about bringing me back down and doing this big build for the anniversary show um at the same time i was going to a point in my career where i was I was a six man, you know, I was in the kingdom. We had yep. won the six man belts, but I wanted more. You know what I mean? I wanted to be a singles guy. And uh, I remember, you know, we had the feud with Cody over the ring. And then there were, there was a couple other things that I was like, 
I, I just didn't think that people maybe saw me as being a far enough, a singles guy, like far enough away from the tag thing yet. And I was kind of racking my brain. I was like, I got to change something up. And I was like, I'm going to change my hair. I've had such mm. like early distinct. And even though I've, you know, half shaved it before or dyed it, I've had this like big, crazy curly hair for such a long time. I was like, I think I'm ready to do it just so I have something fresh and say like, I'm a singles guy. This is, I'm, I'm fresh and new. And like, this is the new package as a singles guy. Um, at the same time, you know, you, you go, you go down and you mention that to the people at, uh, at CMLL and they have to find a dance partner to, to go along with it. Right. So, at first, I thought it was a singles match where all the responsibility was on me, and then it turned into a tag match, and I almost felt responsible for someone else getting their head shaved. <laughs> <up. laughs> but uh, it, the experience alone, uh, man, it will be a chapter of my book uh, if I ever write one about the actual experience of getting my head my head shaved, because the, the match is, is has this crazy story to it. But in the end you only see me get my ponytail cut on mm. camera and it was i knew i was leading to a, a program with with volador jr again but now me as like a a, a full heel because down there i was a baby face from time to time and so matt taven a baby face what, what? <laughs> what? people love matt taven uh, <laughs> uh, gotta try to get the now i gotta try to get the ring of honor fans to feel the same <laughs> <laughs> but uh it, so i'm expecting like we're gonna do something else where volador shaves the rest of my head and you know it's yada 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 uh all of a sudden this old guy comes back with like the oldest pair of clippers ever he's like no M M mexico com uh, commission you must shaved head now and i was like yeah, but isn't, are we going to do something else? Like, nope, 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 right now. And he started, I'm just sitting on a grate on like, in like the back of a hallway in Arena Mexico, just getting my head shaved. I was like, there needs to be a camera. Right. Why isn't this being right. filmed? But yeah, uh, it worked out because no one actually saw me with my full head shaved. There's not a single picture of it. And I was able to come back to Ring of Honor with the mohawk. So mm. I got the last laugh in there. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, at, at, at one point I had to grab the clippers. I was like, sir, you, I think it's these clippers or something, but my hair is just being pulled out. So then I had to find a mirror and there's just me by myself in the bowels of Re Arena Mexico shaving my head. He's so. about to say, he's shaving into your skull, man. Like you like yeah. put, put it into, but, but like, I'm, are you good? You go from like 15, 16,000 people going crazy to just you by yourself getting your hair pulled out. And you're like, oh, this is not how I expected the night to end. <laughs> right. And you mentioned uh, like that specific time in your career. Like, do I, I remember like those days when it was just the, the, the kingdom versus the Bucks and Cody or uh, some combination. Like, and it, and it was like that for like a year some change like I, I i vividly remember these things like it was always you guys closing closing either uh one of the on a club shows or like closing one of the always tv shows and like it was like always kingdom kingdom bucks kingdom bucks like but like the, the, I, i'm sure there were uh you know like it, it kind of got repetitive at times as you as you mentioned but like I, i'm sure there were plenty of good memories like within that like any fond memories that you had from working those guys and like having the crowd just like you know fully embrace what you guys had going on some some fantastic times with with wrestling the elite or the bucks or bullet mm. club or whatever you know version of right trio. there was two stand out in particular and you know honestly it was a good you know two years of us headlining <laughs> every show with with the bucks and and yeah. and, and not to sound kim to, to complain about it at mm. all and I'm not but I just I feel like maybe the kingdom didn't get their just due for that's fair. That's you know fair. what I mean like we understand that everyone loves the young bucks but uh, <laughs> they're out there dancing with someone and uh you know for two years we we were out there killing it with the bucks and I, I you know wrestling today and I've told the young bucks this in person but wrestling today is is completely different because of them they legit changed the world you know as much as that's on the t-shirt is so true and uh, I personally owe so much to them they were great guys um, and helped us out tremendously in ring of honor but 
two matches that stick out in particular. There was a <laughs> there was a nine man six man, if that makes sense. There was a three team six man, which would make it a nine man. So uh, in in London with SCU, the Kingdom, uh-huh. and Bucks and Adam Page where like Cody came out as a referee and, and <laughs> like just all this craziness, but that crowd in London. Sounds like they were loving it. <laughs> absolute fire. It's one of my favorite, favorite matches. And then there was another time where um, we, we wrestled the Bullet Club in like a four on four survival in New York I remember State. that. I remember that. That yeah. just yeah. the craziest moonsault off the balcony in mm-hmm. the hangar line. I remember like looking up and thinking, don't, don't do that. Don't do that. Like, <laughs> that is, you're going to blow your legs right off if you jump yeah. off that. And then he did the most beautiful moonsault. But that match, um, you know, a little bit behind the scenes, we weren't supposed to be in that match. SCU was supposed to be in that match. And something happened. They were flying from California. They didn't end up making it. I remember that. Yeah, I remember and that. And mm. there's another thing that I just feel like the kingdom didn't get their due for. They threw the kingdom in that match last minute. And it's one of the, it was one of the best matches of, of that year. Uh, because we just had such great chemistry with, with the Bucks and Paige and Cody. And, um, you know, there, there's some really fond, fond uh, uh, memories that I have of, of those, those two years, it felt like. But those matches in particular, I, I, I'm hoping that Ring of Honor puts that London match on YouTube just because the atmosphere alone is so – it's off the charts. I mean, obviously, it's on Honor Club, so go and subscribe to Honor Club. But uh, one day that I'm hoping that match – uh, gets a gets a little more sunshine on it because it's it's a it's a good one. Yeah, you, you mentioned the uh, the the, ha- the hammer style ballroom match. Like I I, I think I remember that because I know there were like some travel delays or like it was like a real bad like rainy day or something like that. And I remember uh, one of storm, yeah, yeah that that's what it was. Yeah. And one of I think one of the guys had like just gotten there via a taxi or something like that. It was like he was like in an opening match. It was I can't remember who it was, but I remember that. But uh, like you, like you mentioned. Um, what, what, what I was what I was about to say, I was just about to talk about uh, how yeah, but but you and the you you guys in the Bucks, the Kingdom in the Bucks, like it, as many times as you guys did wrestle, like I genuinely can't remember a time when the fans like weren't interested in you guys' interactions and you guys' matches, like and you guys competed a lot, but like it seemed like every time you guys went out there, the people weren't like you know not paying attention, like they were engaged. You know, it it, it takes a a good good group of dance partners to go out there and, and make the crowd feel that way. But the kingdom was, was perfect heels for and perfect yeah. foil yeah. For, for the bullet club. So that's true. Um, it seemed like whenever you needed it, you could, you could put a combination of that out there and you knew that uh, it was going to be a, a main event that people would be into. So, so I've read that you are going to be in a video game, sir, the virtual basement. <laughs> Yeah. The, virtu- the virtual basement video game. Uh, well, so, so tell me tell me how that came about, man. How excited are you to see uh, Matt Taven in, uh, in virtual form, man? I, I, I'm pumped. I'm pumped because uh, I finally get to get the scans done because, you know, you, people oh, send you, you okay. like their creative wrestler. You uh-huh. know what I mean? And they, they'll send you a creative wrestler and you don't want to be pissed that it's not as good as <laughs> you thought it would be. You're like, that's great. Thanks for making that. Yeah, it'd be nice, though. <laughs> I'm way more jacked and awesome looking than that what the hell uh but (laughs) you know um it's funny because they reached out to me and I I grew up in New Hampshire I'm kind of a New Englander through and through I live in the Boston area now and I went to school in Rhode Island I grew up in New Hampshire so just New England has has been my life and uh they reached out to me as a as a company based in New Hampshire and they knew of like my independent stuff like way back when I started so instantly I like fell in love I was like okay you guys are legit and I hope that whoever you know whoever you guys need I will help you with whatever you know you want to get in contact with but it seems like they have established a, an awesome roster and I was always a big fan of um, like fire pro on, on PlayStation back in the day, it might be too it might be too old for you, but uh, where like <laughs> you know it wasn't like the the you know, classic WWE game or or like WCW game, but like it was a amalgamation of like all the these guys that you saw from around the world. And I think at the time they had to like change their names so they didn't get sued. But you right, you, right, you, right. Like, you know you knew like oh this is like the great Suzuki and stuff, and like this is that, and like this is this is Sasuke, and this is you know and. Uh, I'm kind of excited. I'm hoping 
that virtual basement is kind of like one of those games, but you actually get the, the names of the guys that you know you're playing with. It's not like Starman or whatever. It's, right, it's right. actually Matt Taven. So I'll, I'm pretty pumped for it for the scans alone. But um, I'm, I'm hoping that um, it comes out soon. I know that I was supposed to do scans, I think, now. So I'm assuming that there'll probably be another year it's a year before it comes out. But here's the hoping. Yeah, I, yeah, I think I think that's I think not that's something like that's like a real cool thing to know that, you know, you're going to be in an actual video game and your likeness and your character is going to be like in virtual. I, I know that's probably like one of the coolest things is the, just to know that. But like on, on a more serious note, I remember I think it was last last September or so, I think you announced at, at an ROA show that you had re-signed with the company. And uh, I think it was at the Vegas show, I believe it was. And like, so like, and, and, I, and I know like in the months prior, like, you know, so, stories made the rounds that Matt Taven was about to be a free agent and, you know, it was some some possible other things on the table. But like when, when you came to that final stretch and you decided, you know what, this is where I'm going to stay. I'm going to re-up with Ring of Honor. Like what, what, what were some of the deciding factors that led to that decision? Well, we talked about, you know, the fact that they took, they were so good to me, you know, uh, um, on the, the last time I had surgery and right. had so much faith in me. Um, and then also, you know, I, I'm not deaf or, or blind. I knew that Ring of Honor had, had hit that hard time that we knew was coming when the, you know, the elite and SEU and, and the roster was really going to split um, with the, you know, creation of AEW. Mm -hmm. And so I had this sense of pride to me, like, I, I, I don't want to leave now. <laughs> like, I don't want to leave I, I, when I know, like, we're going to come back up. And I, I want to be a part of that resurgence. I have so much pride in Ring of Honor. I've been here since our first, you know, the first time we were on eye pay-per-view, real pay-per-view. I've been, like, around for all of that. So um, there's definitely, like I said, a part of it that feels like it's kind of my baby or, you know, I'm, I'm part of this. I'm a pillar of this company. And I, um, I, I love that. You know what I mean? I, I appreciate the, the amount of faith that Ring of Honor's had in me uh, over the years. And again, with wrestling, you know, they're always talking about, what about this? What about that? Um, so it's always just up in the air. But when I sat down with ROH, um, really the loyalty that, that they've shown me over the years was the biggest factor. And they, they told me, you know, they, they want – Matt Taven to be a big part of the future here and I, I knew going into probably the last meeting of negotiations I already kind of had in my heart that I wanted to stay uh, so they made it very easy for me by just saying that we want you know we want you to, to be here and uh, we, we see you as a big part of the future and so to have that just kind of stability at home you know what I mean like to know that this place will always have my back and I will always have it. And I don't have to kind of question what, what might happen to Matt Taven if I go here or there um, is, is something that I, I don't think you can really put a price tag on or anything like that. And then granted ring of honors has really built a great like group of people and have taken care of them during the pandemic, like I said, and I've really just kind of built this loyalty around the office and like a, a groundswell of just from the talent of like, yeah, you know what I mean? They've done so much for us. We're so low, we're, we're loyal to them. And now we need to like really kind of amp up this uh, momentum that ring of honor is rebuilding. So I'm a loyal guy. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm a guy that loves when a guy stays with one team for his whole career. It, it's for, for me, Tom Brady leaving. Nah, nah, I knew that was coming. I knew it was coming. You know, it's one of those <laughs> things where I'll, I'll, I'll always be, I'll always, Tom, I'll never say a bad thing about Tom, but it still hurts every time I see right. him. <laughs> so, you know, I, I've always looked up to those guys, you know, the Kobe's, the birds of the world that stayed with that one team and, and really kind of, said like yeah like the name on the front means just as much as the name on the back and um I, i'm i'm proud to be with ring of honor like and, and you know you you mentioned something like it's it's very like very off topic but like i'm 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 like curious like so i, I talked with friends about um of course about the day that that kobe passed away and, and it felt like a collective like sadness like if that's the right word like around the world and it, it, it was like so weird dude because like i felt like everybody was like somehow connected to this individual that we never met in person like never met this dude like 
like was it kind of the same thing for you in a way like that like it was like just that like that damn like type of feeling like this is something that really happened so i i flew out to california immediately i mm. I, I, I don't like it just came over me i i'm a lifelong basketball fan you know mm. i grew up and kobe has been a mortal enemy of, mm. of Celtics, Celtics right. like myself for for his entire career so i grew up you know, going to the Boston Garden, the the old one, and seeing as many basketball games as humanly possible. And just, you know, basketball is one of those organizations that really puts their stars forward and oh, yeah. you have this mm. this attachment to them. You know what I mean? I have Michael Jordan's towel somewhere around here <laughs> that I, I took off him when he was leaving, like, uh, oh, you that, know, walking cool. back to the locker room. I've held it since I was 10 years old. I'll never get rid of it. You know, I just have this special kind of feeling with uh with basketball and the nba in general and when kobe died in such a tragic way it was it was like you said it was i, I couldn't explain it it was just a weird yeah. sadness that i just felt like i gotta go and like show my respects or do something like i had this weird frenetic energy of like i'm sad here and i don't want to just be upset about it in my own apartment like i was seeing the 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 um staples center start to have the memorials around mm. it and i was like i need to be a part of that so i literally the next morning flew out to la uh spent a couple of days out there just kind of being a part of, of being a part of it and, and just kind of showing my respects because I, I think that um as much as as athletes maybe you know they say they they don't want to be necessarily role models or part of your life life like that but they they affect your life in, in so much way like you see so many things that you don't realize you're picking up and like I don't realize that I'm picking up that you know mamba mentality from watching right. someone but I am even like stuff that I do in the ring like I do that weird underbite thing that Kobe <laughs> to do when he's like mad I don't know if I stole it from him or if I just do that in general and like I would see that stuff and these stories are so inspiring to all athletes of, of every sport um, that it's hard not to see a guy who just works so hard and like grinds it out and succeeds in his career and not get behind him. So I think there's a little bit of, of that, whether you want to call it a Mamba mentality, attitude, ins inspiration, there's a little bit of that in all of us. And so, you know, when he did pass away so tragically, I just felt like, uh, like you said, there was a sadness and I had to show my respects. And uh, I would have liked the Celtics to take it home this year. Uh, but to the fact that, that the Lakers won. Uh, it, it, it was a storybook ended, man. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm okay ending. with that. I'll let it slide this year. It, it kind of transitioned over to a positive note. Of course, we, you got the big, the big moment at Madison Square Garden at G1 Supercar. But, like, I, I'm, I'm more curious about – like what? What was the media like after that? Because I know you did a bunch of interviews, man. Like, <laughs> uh, like I remember during that period of time, all I would see was Matt Taven interview, Matt Taven interview, Matt Taven interview. What What is the 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 media schedule like for somebody in that position? Because I know it is just hectic. It, it is. Uh, it's crazy because it's not just before. It's not just after. It's before as well. Yeah, the lead up to it, right? So yeah. So like the the you know the week before, I remember like um, I even went down to New York a couple of days beforehand because I had to do like busted open, and then we had <laughs> like the the festival thing, and right. then we had this and that, and it's so chaotic that it's almost a good thing because you have no time to really think about Madison Square Gardens tomorrow or two days or three days. You're like so go 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 that you don't have a chance to really stress too much. Um, but then on the flip side, after you win the belt and you're still in that crazy schedule, I mean, seven days later, I'm defending it in Pittsburgh. And every day in between, like you said, it's just interview after interview after interview. <laughs> so while your friends and family are like, you just won the title at Madison Square Garden, you're like, yes, and I'll get back to you in a second. <laughs> I have to go do this. Um, so it's, it's, it's crazy. And uh, it, weirdly, like during the pandemic, I finally had time to kind of go back and watch all that stuff. and enjoy it the maybe the way I should have in the moment um but yeah it's it's such a he hectic schedule that um it, it's it's funny because you really don't have a chance to smell the roses at all during yeah. the time uh and and really not until that belt's gone do you have a chance to look back at any of those moments you you I, I think you hit that a lot from wrestlers that were in similar positions that you were as the world champion like 
they 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 never really realize what's going on until after they're not the world champion anymore. Cause it's like, you don't get to fully, you know, embrace what's going on. Cause you just on go mode 24 seven. Like, like you said, you calling in the radio stages at eight o'clock in the morning and then, you know, doing all this other different type of stuff. But now it's like, once you, once you lose the belt, it's like, damn, I was the world champion. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, was it that like one of those type of feelings? Oh, can you hear me? You're doing like radio, oh, you're yeah, doing you the news. You're doing, you know, this and that. And in between, you know, you got plenty of haters on your phone telling you you suck and you shouldn't be world champion. And at the same time, like, you're like, oh, I'm going to show everyone. You know, especially at that time, too, you know, we talked about it. The AEW split had just happened. So I just had this, like, next, next, next. Give me what's next. I'm going to bust this out. I'm going to crush this interview. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I had such that mentality that literally until my ankle exploded, I, I, I had no – not a single chance to kind of sit back and think you used to act like you were winning the the world title at Madison Square Garden when you were seven years old in your parents living room and that actually happened so it's uh, it's definitely a crazy crazy experience and I enjoy it now more than right. I did at all at the time okay and I, I got, I got one, one question for you speaking of media when is the Take a Bump podcast coming back, Matt? <laughs> when, 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 are we, when are we back on the waves, man? When, when is it coming back? Uh, you know what? I'm not sure. I talked to Danny uh, recently, and I think during the pandemic, you know, Danny had some other things going on, and he's trying to get those off the ground. So uh, right now I'm trying to get this trend thing going. So, you know, never say never. Uh, right now we're both just trying to get things back to where they were, you know, right. a, after all the craziness. Maybe in 2021, uh, I think for the rest of the year, though, we're, we're both kind of focused on our, on our own little projects. But, uh, you know, Take a Bump is, is a, it, it's a project of love of mine. And uh, I would love to get back to it uh, sometime soon. It's, a, it's crazy because I think I, I remember the first time I saw you wrestle live was uh, 2018. It was in the summer of 2018. I think July was at the, in Fairfax, Virginia. And I oh. went there. Yeah, it was, it was at that show when, when you, Cody, Jay Lethal, and Dalton Castle had the world title match at the Tavens. I, I remember that. And I, I, it was just crazy to me, like, just thinking back, like, how long that was ago and how much has changed yeah. since then. Because I know during that time, they were on the kind of the build to uh, All In. And then, like, Ring of Honor also had their big show, their kind of final battle coming up so late, later in the month where they were, you know, kind of making the plays to, to, to get the storyline set up for that stuff. So, it, it, like, it's just crazy to see how much has changed over the past two years in, in wrestling, man. Oh, you hear me? That was my last match. Uh, so, like, that was my last match in the States for, for a while. Mm. Um, but, yeah, it's it's funny because, you know, I was saying earlier, like, I, I post on my, like, IG story, like, this happened two years ago. This happened three years ago. Right. And it doesn't – until you see the number, either it feels like a million years ago or it feels <laughs> like yesterday. It never feels like the time it is supposed to be. And, like, I, I posted something with all of us in that Soaring Cup tournament – and like Jay White and Flip are messaging me like, that was three years ago? My God. I was like, is that, do you think it was short or long? Because I feel like that was a century ago. Right. And like Flip was like, I felt like that was yesterday. I was like, of course you did. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just one of those things where our sense of time is so skewed that um, when you mentioned Fairfax, it, it feels like a long, long time ago. It is two years ago. Yeah. You know, it's not that long ago, but wrestling moves that quick. Mm -hmm. and, and, and lastly, here before we wrap it up, man, one one thing that I really did want to talk to you about was the uh, the, the sixty minute uh, sixty minute draw that you had with Jay Lethal at uh, at seventeenth anniversary. Like when, when when you guys are are going into that man, and you know that it's going to be a, a sixty minute draw, like like just 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 talk about how you know you guys approach that. Because mainly, you know, when you see a match go that long, I think it's, it can be difficult at times to keep fans fully invested for that whole 60 minutes. But I think you guys did a really solid job of keeping people interested for a great portion of that. Uh, like, just tell me, what, what, would you, what would you and Lethal think of going into that and how were you guys going to plan on keeping people interested for that whole 60 minutes? Well, first, Jay Lethal is my favorite opponent of all time. I think he, I, as much as people think he's great in the ring, he, it's, he's underappreciated for how good he is. Mm -hmm. um, but 
it's so funny you say that because we had the same thought going into it. You know, you, you watch all these Iron Man matches going, going into it. I'm a huge Bret Hart fan. So, you know, I'm watching that one. I'm watching uh, Kurt and Brock and all these different Iron Man matches. And, and if you go back and watch a lot of them, you know, a lot of them kind of start off slow at the beginning. Yep. And so, you know, a little bit of wrestling. And so me and Lethal were like, let's do the opposite. Let's start really fast let's uh, do some weird stuff right out the beginning let's let's kind of get this thing moving um and then we really kind of planned the back half of it but we were like we're gonna start fast and then we'll kind of just figure it out and then 30 you know later on we had plans but that first half of the match is kind of just us we know each other really well we wrestle each other a million times just us kind of knowing a pace we want to be at and, and doing things but there's one time, <laughs> there's one time I think I hit like a regular suplex and go for a pin and maybe grab something. And uh, me and Jay are talking. I'm like, I think we're at 15. He's like, yeah, we're probably at like 12, 15. And the referee comes over and is like, six minutes. I was like, <laughs> oh my God, we're dead. We're going to, we're going to die out here. Uh, but like, it, it's one of those things where it's hard to explain. Like, and people say magic happens. It really kind of feels like that. It's uh, you, you have a game plan of how you want to plan it out, but a million people have gone into matches with, with a game plan that has not worked out. Mm -hmm. So you, you have no idea really what you're getting into until the kind of, you feel that crowd and the, the snowball starts kind of going downhill. And man, once we hit 30 minutes and I knew really what was going to happen next, I could feel the crowd. I was like, Oh my, we, we got them. We got them. This is, this is going perfect. And it is by far, the proudest I am of any match ever of my career. Um, I, it's my, my personal favorite match. And when people bring up Madison Square Garden, I immediately bring up Vegas because to me, it, the Madison Square Garden doesn't happen if that 60 minutes doesn't go well in Vegas. Mm. You know what I mean? I, I honestly think like next day it's announced that it's, it's not me in the main event if I stink, if I have a stinker in, um, in Vegas. But I, I personally, you know, look up to Jay Lethal in a way that um, I, I put him on a pedestal with some of the best workers of all time. And to watch myself, and even when I watch it back now, go 60 minutes with a guy of that caliber, um, it, it's, it really kind of gives me a sense of pride in myself that um, I, I'm not sure many other things do. And, and you know, just, just to piggyback off what you just said, like, I feel like but like even my my attention span as a fan, it, it 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 can it can vary sometimes. You know, even when I'm watching stuff, I'm like, ah, here we go, like long, <laughs> about to drag this out. But like, what, like like when specifically speaking about that match, from what I remember from it, you guys did kind of pace it really well. And while I wasn't in it all the way, I was in it for a great portion of it. You know what I'm saying? I think that's a that's a huge accomplishment for 60 minutes, an hour. You know what I'm saying? To have somebody's attention. So I think you guys did a, a real solid job at that. I, I always say at our, at our wrestling school, I'm like, y you know, like people have these in their hands at all times. <laughs> this is way more entertaining than what, <laughs> what could be going on at the ring at times. So like, if you guys are sticking it up, I'm just going to watch a video or text my friends or do anything. Right. And uh, so our attention span, I think as a society has gotten smaller and smaller. So to go 60 minutes in 2019, uh, I feel like is a feat that um, I hope I don't have to do again anytime soon, <laughs> but it, it's definitely an accomplishment that, that it really is at the top of the list. It is, man, from the man himself. Uh, Matt, any, uh, any links you want to plug, merchandise, social media, uh, please, floor is yours. Uh, everything will be linked in the video. I, I appreciate that. But, uh, you know, Ring of Honor, every Monday we have a watch party using the hashtag ROH pure if you haven't checked out ring of honor since our return of the pandemic i'm not just saying this because obviously i'm, I'm on the roster mm -hmm. but it is the best product in wrestling today the pure tournament has been so unbelievable and as a wrestling fan i, I i'm telling you i don't take it from me take it from yourself check it out monday nights we'll have a watch party for me personally matt taven T-A-V-E-N. You can find uh, me on all social media platforms. Matt Taven on Twitter. Matt Taven on Facebook. Pro Wrestling Tees. Instagram is the Matt Taven. Um, and like I said, ROHWrestling.com, the Honor Club. You can keep up with almost everything that I'm doing. 
uh, if you're not following me personally, but you should follow me personally. You should follow <laughs> the trend and get a new trend t-shirt at rohshop.com. It is, ladies and gentlemen, from the man himself. Everybody, this is former Ring of Honor world champion. I am Andrew Thompson of the Andrew Thompson Interviews YouTube channel, and we are out. Peace. <laughs>